On the show this morning, we'll be looking at uh, Nasima's challenge to Tinubu on SMEs, private sector-driven economy. We'll also be taking a look at the success rate of small businesses in the Nigerian environment. Good morning and welcome to The Breakfast. My name is Nyamgul Agaji. It's a pleasure to have you join us. We can understand what a lot of people are passing through. I'm sure that the um, viewership today will even be more because so many people will be sitting at home. And it's not because they chose to, but some of them, because they have not been paid uh, their monthly salary, because it's delaying because of a lot of challenges that even the employers of labor uh, are facing, uh, they do not even have the money to go to work. Because whatever they had budgeted for the month as transportation uh, is now nothing to write home about. Maybe uh, money that should have taken you for one full week will now be money that will take you for one day or two days because the transportation uh, or the fares have gone up. So many things are happening now because of this uh, fuel subsidy removal. Of course, we'll be looking at the headlines also on the program today, and I'm sure a lot of things will be uh, also tied to the fuel subsidy removal. While people are commending or were uh, calling for the fuel subsidy removal, it seems as if a lot of people didn't see the consequences of the removal, at least the immediate consequences of the removal. Uh, for a country that has just uh, well, I use the word suffered, uh, cash crunch, which put a lot of people in trouble. A lot of people suffered a, a lot of damages and uh, lost a lot of things because of the cash crunch that came up just before the elections. And then now we're suffering this again. Uh, and a lot of people are asking the questions, why would, in an open economy, why would uh, prices be set for a commodity uh, by a, a, a body that should be like a regulatory body or something, you're setting prices that this is what it's supposed to be. A, a few moments ago, a few days ago, a few weeks ago, um, there was this general complaint that the airlines should not have put a uniform price for whatever the fares uh, should be because it's an open market. Let the market forces be the ones to drive whatever the price is going to be. But they put a uniform price and they said that was not acceptable. The government itself said that was not acceptable. Now NNPC has put their own price and even a filling station that may have thought that, okay, till the end of June, let me do uh, what I'm supposed to do as a patriotic Nigerian and let my, my pump price be the same till the end of June that we know the fuel subsidy removal will actually uh, kick off. Uh, they will also borrow a leaf from uh, what it should have been like a government parastatal and do the needful. So right now, as we speak, the lowest filling station in Nigeria is selling fuel for 500 Naira, at least the ones that we know. Uh, the ones that we do not know that may be selling less than that, uh, bravo to you, congratulations. You, are, you have earned our respect as patriotic Nigerians who think uh, that they should do the best for the citizenry. Uh, as I, a lot of people w were going back yesterday and they knew they would not be coming to work today because of the kind of uh, things they met. You come with a, a fare and when you're going back, you pay double. This morning also people woke up, went to the roads. I saw some people turning back and once the price is told them that this is what you're going to pay to a particular place that you're going to, they just turn back dejected, knowing that they may lose that job because they don't even have the money. And then others that are, are strong enough are trekking. But how far can you trek? A lot of people live in Mowe and they come to work on the island every day because houses in Lagos are not affordable. A lot of people come from so many other places that are far, but at least they knew or they know all the time that they can always have um, a vehicle to take them here. But right now, those vehicles are not available anymore because no fuel. So there are fewer vehicles on the road, there are more people on the road, and then employers of labor, I just hope that you will understand with a lot of people. Today we do business uh, because it's a Thursday. Thursday we zero in on the things that we can 
glean from the business world and educate ourselves and try to find out solutions to the kind of problems that we may have in our economy. So we'll be having some people join us later on on the show to talk on these uh, issues that I've talked about. Nasima is challenging Tinubu on SMEs and private sector driven economy and we're also uh, looking at uh, how small businesses in Nigerian environment uh, have succeeded so far and all that. So. Did I even tell you my name? My name is Nyamgul Agaji, and I'm home alone today uh, because of um, obvious reasons, and uh, we're, we're glad that at least we could connect today. So when you go into the social media space, uh, you go into uh, the internet and you want to, to look at the stories, you find one particular story about Trump. Trump is a um, former American president vying for the position again uh, he was uh, ousted by Joe Biden, who is now the, the, the president of America, who is also still uh, trying to uh, recontest the election to be president. We also have found out that Mike Pence, a former vice president, is also in the race. He has thrown his um, weight inside the race, and he wants to run for president as well. And a lot of other big names in the American uh, political space. But the story about Trump now is that he has vowed to stop Nigerians and others from getting U.S. birthright citizenship if elected or if re-elected. Now, what that means is that a lot of people like in Nigeria, you have the opportunity to travel to America and your wife is pregnant or you yourself, you're just pregnant and you can go to America. You just time it in such a way that when you get to America, you just give birth and when you give birth, your child automatically becomes an American citizen and enjoy the privileges of two citizenships so, uh, and so many other things that people do. So uh, Trump is saying that just because you can do that, um, there is no way that you're going to get citizenship anymore. He vows to stop Nigerians and others from getting U.S. bet right citizenship if re-elected. So if he's re-elected, you know that you have to give birth to your child in Nigeria. Or if you're going there, it doesn't change anything. Or except you choose another country to go and give birth to your child to get that uh, um, country's citizenship for your child and all that. So that's what he has vowed to do. It's not just Nigeria. I'm saying, I'm calling Nigeria because that's what concerns us uh, in uh, uh, this country. So a lot of people have this dual citizenship because of uh, where they were born. Now, federal government meets NLC over fuel subsidy removal. Uh, the federal government has met the uh, Nigerian Labor Congress. Or they had a meeting yesterday, Nigerian Labor Congress, TUC, and, um, and the federal government. But... According to the federal government, the, the, mis the, meeting was, um, the meeting was very successful, but in successful, I, I do not mean that they had solutions. There were no solutions. The federal government didn't give any, any further details of how successful the meeting was, but they said the discussion uh, was um, very high, uh, the spirits were high and everything, but they didn't give the details of what happened. But the TUC and NLC, uh, have both come, up, uh, come out to say that they didn't reach any agreement. Now, this is the quarrel of the TUC and NLC, that there are no palliatives, there, are no, there is no roadmap, there is no clear-cut uh, definition of what this fuel subsidy removal actually is and what it will mean to the Nigerian populace. What has the government done so far to make sure that the suffering of the people will not be as high as is being anticipated? And then why did the uh, NNPC just fix price of uh, fuel uh, at a time when the subsidy has not actually been removed because we still have till the end of June and all that. So there were so many uh, questions that the federal government needed to answer. But as it stands now, they couldn't answer the questions the way uh, NLC and TUC wanted these questions to be answered. And the solutions that they wanted for the people of Nigeria, the federal government so far has not been able to give solutions. So where are we in the scheme of things? Every time everybody will be talking about fuel subsidy being a scam that a lot of people have been enjoying. Yeah, we agree. A lot of people who shouldn't be enjoying our uh, commonwealth, 
uh, were enjoying the money that they, they termed uh, fuel subsidy. But right now that it has been removed, how will the Nigerians uh, feel? How will the lives of the Nigerian people uh, improve? What is the roadmap to making this uh, improved livelihood come to us? Nobody knows anything about this. Think, things that are going to be discussed or the NLC is trying to discuss with the federal government are things that should have been discussed um, before even the pronouncement was made. That's the argument from a lot of quarters. But right now, we do not know whether um, it's a good thing or a bad thing that is coming to us or whether the same money that was supposed to go for subsidy will have another name under a different subhead and the same people who were enjoying it were going to be enjoying and then will be the worst for it. Okay. We also have another story, um, which is sort of like trending, from Abia State. Uh, the governor there, uh, Oti, Alex Oti, has announced immediate suspension of transport levies in Abia State. Now, this is one governor that, if he continues the way he is doing right now, he may just be one of the best. Uh, I do hope that the spirit that he has started this administration with uh, will still be sustained until the end of this tenure, this four years that he's going to be at the helm of affairs in Nabia State. He started by um, setting up a high-level committee, transition committee, comprising people who a lot of uh, experts say that uh, were round, round pegs and round holes and nothing will be left untouched. Um, as they were talking about transition committee. And then when he was sworn in, he had the secretary to the state government already, he had the, uh, the spokesman for the, for the government, he had some key uh, positions the same day that he was sworn in. And if you start that way, a lot of people will start to build confidence in you. And for any administration, confidence building is a very key factor. Let the people believe what you're doing because they feel or they trust you because of the kind of things you have done before and the things that they, you say you are going to do. If they trust you, your government is going to be um, smooth as it is. But how will you let the people trust you? By uh, putting the right people in the right places and also being transparent enough for the people to see uh, what is being done in your state, uh, what is being done because of them or by them or for them. Let it not just be that you sit in government house and you decide things to be done for your people. That is not democracy. And that's what we're saying. The rule, the role of true leadership in progress of institutions. Uh, what, what, what is true leadership in the first place? And what are these institutions that we talk about all the time? In Nigeria, we say our institutions are not as strong as the individuals. And I keep asking the, questions, uh, the question, how can an in institution be stronger than individuals if the individuals that uh, should superintend on the, uh, over the, on the, the institutions rather, um, are not ready to do what they're supposed to do? Is it because of the law? Let's say the judiciary, for instance. Um, the judiciary is there. The law established the judiciary. The law is there. Everything that we, we need for the judiciary to work is there. It's in the books. But are the people who are supposed to work within that sphere honest enough? Are the people who are supposed to enforce the laws or yeah, or the judgments from the courts and all that. Are they are they patriotic enough? Are they disciplined enough? Are they straightforward enough? Are they transparent enough? Uh, are they ready to obey the law and keep to the law? Sometimes you make the laws and you fail from keeping the laws. So, well, we're looking at the role of true leadership in the progress of institutions. How can the true leadership make our institutions better? Okay, let's, let's just take a, a, a look at one of the videos that we need you to just see. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Craig, I have a couple of remarks to make, and it's related to what Professor Lemumba talked about. The first thing is that I think we have a misreading of our own history in Africa. And here is a correction. It wasn't Ghana that was the first country in Africa to become independent. That's wrong. 
historically it's wrong. It was the Sudan that became the first independent post-colonial African country. January 1st, 1956, almost a year earlier than, the, and than uh, uh, Ghana itself. So that's a correction that we need to make, give the credit to the Sudan. The second remark I would like to make is that uh, Professor Lemumba celebrated many of our leaders. But retrospectively, if you look at the presidents who have performed the best for the African people, many of the names he mentioned wouldn't rise to the top. So I have two countries who have been led incredibly well, but who never or rarely ever get the credit for that. And they are models that we should be all copying. The first one is Seret Sekhama of Botswana. President Hama and the late Vice President and then President Masseri built a country from scratch. And Botswana became an African miracle. So if we want to know and understand how to build countries, we should look at Botswana as a model. Second country is Mauritius. These two countries, their annual growth, economically speaking, over the last 40 years almost, has been competing on the growth rate with the East Asians of Taiwan and Korea and others like them. Botswana ran 7, 8, 10% growth annually. So did Mauritius. The level of corruption in the public sector in Botswana is among the lowest in the continent if not the world, so is Mauritius. And therefore, Botswana, for instance, has over $10 billion in foreign reserves. No other African country can say that. That didn't go to President Masseri or President Hama or those who came after them, their pockets. So these are two countries, if we want to see models of Africa that works, an Africa that's marching towards prosperity despite inequality in all of us. Those are the two or three places that we need to, to look at. The final remarks there is that I'm Abdi Samatar from Somalia. This is my first session in Parliament. Somalia is known as a basket case. But I want to give you a two-second history of the country because just like Hama in Botswana and in Mauritius, Somalia did something before any other African country post-independence did. Somalia was the first place in this continent from Cairo to Cape, from Mogadishu to Dakar, where there was a democratic change of government several times in the 1960s when the rest of the continent was wrecked by coups and single party states. I wrote a book about that called Africa's First Democrats. So don't think of Somalia as Al-Shabaab. Think of President Osman and Prime Minister Hussein, who set the tone for what it means to be a democratic, free, and an African country. So Somalis are Africa's first Democrats. Thank you very much, sir. When I was watching that clip, I was just um, uh, imagining a, a people without a history, people who will forget their history because of one thing or the other. Uh, in Nigeria even, history was removed from the curriculum and then a lot of people had to shout and shout and shout before it was returned. And even if it was, or even when it was returned, or when, when we were still uh, taking history in our schools, what kind of history were we learning? Where we're learning that Mongo Park was the person who discovered a lot of things. Uh, you, somebody will come and discover a river uh, in a place where people were al already living there. And he enters the history books as the first person to discover the a river and uh, all that. What kind of history were we studying? Were we studying the history of our fathers and really the people that existed in this entity called Nigeria? before the coming of the whites, as it is, or the colonial masters, or we are studying the history of people who came and colonized us and made a name for themselves and all that. 
we've heard stories of people who we idolize as people who were role models in those days, uh, pre-colonial times and during colonial times. And we've seen that some of them were really terrible people. But because the history has given them a good name, it means that they are good people. How can we leave the history of our people and concentrate on the people who came to uh, colonize us and give, give us a history that is suitable for them? We jettisoned all the things that were tradition. We jettisoned everything that was culture. We jettisoned all the things that were um, values in the African, uh, African continent and then took something that was alien to us, hook, line, and sinker. The same way we have taken democracy, that doesn't seem to be working in states of Africa. Well, we're glad that that clip was able to tell us some of the things we needed to remember about history, which we just overlooked or just decided not to uh, know anything about. A lot of people thought that it was Ghana that, first of all, had uh, independence, but right now we know better. And um, A lot of people do not know that in Africa there are those that have, uh, should be called the first Democrats, and we didn't know about that. But the crux of the matter is that if you become a leader, uh, what will you be remembered for if you leave the, the scene? Because everybody must leave the scene. And I always say that whoever never thinks about legacy is one of the most dangerous people on earth. If you leave your life and you don't think about what you're going to leave behind, what people are going to remember you by, then you are a dangerous person. Because you are the person uh, because of whom this saying uh, was coined. Man die go, woman born another. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter. Uh, whatever you do, your life ends where it, when it ends, and it, you don't care what happens after that, because other people will come on, take the shoes, wear them, and do what they're supposed to do. You don't care what name you leave behind, because after all, you're dead. That's not the kind of people that we want in our community. So if you need to be a leader, uh, you need to have a mindset that you need to leave a legacy. I'm not talking about legacy projects, building flyovers in a place where there are two cars. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, leaving your people better, leaving a good name that will be remembered for years to come. Today, we remember the Awala Wars of, of, of yesteryear. We remember the Zeke, the, all the people that fought for our independence. Uh, they may have their shortcomings, but we remember them for what they did, the general picture that they saw and brought to uh, fruition. So now we have a Nigeria. If you are having a political role or any other role for that matter, how are you? Uh, how are you fitting into that role? How are you doing your best to make sure that when you leave, people will remember you? Today, we remember uh, our leaders. We've had Obasanjo superintending over the affairs of Nigeria uh, when we returned to demo democracy in 1999. We also had Yara Dua. We had uh, Jonathan. We've had Buhari. Buhari has left the scene. Now we have uh, Bola Ahmed Tinubu and we'll still keep having leaders. But in your mind right now, even as I'm mentioning these people, you know, you know who you will think uh, is the best among them. And then you have your ratings for all these leaders. So if you become a leader now, how will people rate you? Everything lies at, on the table of the person who is leading. They say on easy, we are, on easy, uh, is the head or lies the head that wears the crown or something like that. So if you wear the crown, be sure that you're going to face some hardships and all that. But at the end of the day, let the people applaud you when you leave the scene. We've seen presidents that handed over, went their way, and they were called by their people to come and take the reins again, even though they didn't want to. These are people who impacted lives. But you, if you're a leader, as a family man, as a little counselor, as a sweeper in the office, as an MD somewhere, as somebody of influence anywhere that you are, what have you been doing? So don't say the system is bad. It takes one person to change the, the entire system. Do not say because the system is corrupted, you cannot do your best. Even in this administration, we, we know people who, in spite of the system, or the last administration, in spite of the system, they were doing well. How can, what can you do? Why can't you be one of those people that will be applauding afterwards? Everything that happens in Africa is leadership. 
and we should stop as leaders being selfish and greedy. That's the major thing. So right now, um, it's been raining in Lagos. I don't know if that was what was predicted for today. It's been raining in Lagos and maybe some other parts of Nigeria. But for the details of our weather, let us take this weather report.